Humanitarian Education, the Need to Scale is the title of this presentation. It was first presented at the uh, European MOOC Summit at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland on the 12th of February 2014. So in 20 minutes, I'd like to cover five points. The first is about training, how we do it in the human humanitarian sector. The second is just uh, numbers on, on the need to scale. The third is uh, looking at what's broken, but also what works in humanitarian education, what its strengths are. Uh, VUCA is the um, key concept introduced in the fourth um, uh, point. And last but not least, things to consider if your IGO or uh, INGO is uh, looking at developing a MOOC. So first, uh, training. We have what I call the black hole. So in, um, in my previous um, organization, um, the organization in 2010 had spent almost 24 million Swiss francs on, uh, on uh, the line item called workshops and training. Nobody actually knows or was able to document how that money was used, much less uh, what effect or outcome it had in terms of outcomes and performance for either individuals or the organization. So this is a problem, and it's not just an evaluation problem, it also looks at, well, the costs and the efficiency and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at the, in the humanitarian sector, we have a, basically this is the industrial age model of schooling. So this is a, a elementary school classroom from Greece in 1983. And now the interesting thing is that you can find the uh, analog, the parallel uh, to this in humanitarian context. This is livelihood training in Sri Lanka in 2006. Precisely the same architecture of uh, learning, uh, precisely the same transmissive model, the sort of passive recipient, uh, no learner dialogue, at least in this, uh, in this picture can be seen. Now in humanitarian context, um, there are many different ways in which you know, uh, people learn and train. Uh, you can see there is a lot more dynamic uh, you know, so stuff going on here. Uh, here's an amazing piece of uh, educational technology called the whiteboard. Um, here, this must be some kind of icebreaker. I haven't been able to figure out which one. So this is an African context. And you can see the other thing I pick up that's interesting from my perspective is that there are mobile phones on the table, but they're not being used in the training. This is uh, Haiti cholera prevention. Uh, after the earthquake, so here you can see that there are there is obviously a community component. Um, these are volunteers that are preparing to do cholera prevention. Obviously, probably the guy on the left is a trainer, or leader, or moderator, or facilitator, or what have you. Um, but there is obviously uh, um, yes, a, a sort of dialogue between uh, between learners. This is a uh, training under a tent with a pastoralist in Kenya. This is in South Sudan. And now this is a wonderful piece of a uh, part of our learning culture is uh, things like first aid. When an organization teaches first aid, it's all about how to. There is no way to sort of teach it through lecture. So you have to do, you have to touch and feel, you need haptics. And this is really one of the strengths of uh, of uh, our learning culture. This is Bangladesh in 2009. Now the second, uh, the second interesting characteristic of humanitarian training is its use of simulation. So this is how you teach experience, not just uh, provide instruction. And here's a couple of examples to illustrate that. So we have a diversity of contexts. Now, why do we need to scale? So here are a few numbers to, th to consider. So first of all, if you look at, say, uh, for example, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, we're talking about 15 million volunteers worldwide working in 189 countries. Um, now, the Red Cross, in addition, trains 17 million people in first aid each year. So this is the general public. It's not the 15 million volunteers. And we know that um, these 17 million people are going to provide um, support and use those first aid skills with 46 million people. Now, um, so the, uh, the humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross are already delivering training on a massive scale, but we do it the old fashioned way. That now there's some other challenges that are really, really pushing organizations to look at how to scale up. 30 million is the number of deaths related to non-communicable diseases. And these are preventable through simple behavior change that works, that will save lives. How you sort of scale up the, the, the uh, training that, that leads to behavior change is one of the key challenges. 320 million people affected by climate change related disasters in 2015. Now, how we're going to face that one with the current capacity of the sector, there's simply not enough people trained and not enough people with professional skills with the right kinds of skills needed to face challenges like this one. And this is far from the only one. These are just a few indicative numbers. There are many more grim figures that show that currently with the current approaches to learning, education and training, the humanitarian sector 
is simply not going to be able to prepare enough people to face these coming challenges. Leave aside this, uh, the questions around financing and so on and just look at the, the sort of capacity of the sector to face up to these challenges. Now, I, I said that humanitarian education is broken and I'd like to talk about what's broken specifically. So. First of all, we've got high turnover, lack of standardization. We've got a proliferation of master's programs that produce, you know, brilliant young people that are not simply not capable of delivering what 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 they need to be able to do on the job. So they end up learning their professional skills, you know, um, through experience, which is not necessarily a bad way to do it. But then leads you to question why they paid they made that initial investment in a very probably very expensive edu formal education. Last but not least, and this is related to the black hole. I mentioned earlier, there's simply the dearth of evaluation. Evaluation of learning, learning is assumed to be inherently good. Training is a is a budget line where you can spend money. So there's all kinds of reasons why we don't evaluate uh, learning, education, and training. Now, I'd also like to say a few words about what works. I mentioned uh, for things like first aid, where you have sort of teaching practical skills, how-to skills. I think we're very good at that. Distance learning in most in many organizations is actually quite well developed as as uh, e-learning. So yes, some of it is behaviorist compliance, uh, uh, compliance oriented uh, uh, click through uh, trainings where you take a multiple choice quiz at the end. But there's uh, there's some interesting things, and it's now fairly well accepted that you do this e-learning as at least as pre-work, at least as preparation for the real training in quotes. So. Um, of course, uh, what I'm interested in is how much more you can do with distance learning beyond this uh, this kind of uh, e-learning. Um, third is a peer community-based education. So if you look at the training of volunteers, chances are that the trainer is uh, is a peer, somebody from the community. That's a very powerful model for um, not just for education, but also for social change, for effecting, sort of ingraining, embedding change and um, and humanitarian work within a, a community and making sure that it's true to the needs of the community. And I think that that's something that in the best of cases, we also do quite well. Now, the professional networks that enable you to get your next job if you're a professional humanitarian, um, the network that gets you the information you need to do your job once you have it is built on exclusivity. So these are sort of small, tightly knit networks. In the worst of cases, they're clicks, but they're also quite powerful because they get you, they actually get you, enable you to sustain both your career and enable you to work effectively. There's some problems related with that as we want to open up with e-learning, then the question becomes, um, you know, if you have people who already have a professional network will say, well, I don't have time to do the uh, distance learning. And the risk is to have a number of people, groups of people with without the professional networks or disconnected from the networks that matter, go into these distance learning programs, come out with improved knowledge and skills, but still remain just as disconnected as they were before. So we have to look at where is the high value knowledge and who owns it and how it circulates in, in order to be able to get anywhere. And that's precisely the problem is around the changing nature of knowledge. So for example, I'd like to speak about, introduce this acronym VUCA to describe uh, what our learning contexts actually look like today. So volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous is, are the four terms that I would use to characterize them. And you really want to go from the Tuskegee Airmen, this is the, the era during World War II where instructional design, the idea that you could sort of design uh, instruction as a a, a sort of step-by-step -step process in which you have a procedure, you implement it, you apply it, you design it. Um, and, um, and it's significant, of course, that at the same time that you have this kind of approach, you also have uh, training that was previously closed to certain segments of society. And, and here, uh, African-American men opened up. Um, now, that was fine for World War II. And in fact, some people say that thanks to, to the work of Robert Gagné and others, um, this is one of the reasons, this was one of the decisive reasons why um, to explain US uh, air superiority uh, during the uh, Second World War. Now, what do we have today? Today we have, and this is really in the late 90s, a, a group of um, uh, learning and development people looked at aircraft carriers. And it turns out that an aircraft carrier is so complex, um, nobody actually has the manual. 
there is no way to write a procedure that describes how you operate an aircraft carrier. Nobody knows how, how it works. And yet, it's one of the highest reliability organizations that can be found. So it's interesting first to, to, to recognize that yes, it is possible to achieve high reliability, but it cannot be broken down into sort of component procedural knowledge. So we've really gone from the era in World War II, instructional design step by step, to something much more complex that has to do with a changing, of, a changing nature of knowledge. And this is what the, I want to get into in the next slides. So this is all from George Siemens Knowing Knowledge. Absolutely brilliant book. Um, it describes uh, connectivism in 2006. So basically looking at how technology is embedded in learning and what happens when there is simply too much knowledge flowing. So what happens when your inbox is too full? You know you're not going to get the the, the message, you know, to, to read all of the 200 messages after you've been away for three days. This is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. But the idea, the change, in uh, the sort of conceptual change we need, the shift, the paradigm shift we need to make is really from knowledge um, as a reservoir, which is how you, we, we conceptualized it historically. This is how courses work. A course is basically a container for knowledge uh, to knowledge as a river. And then what happens? How do you use that river? How do you tap into it to extract the things you need? That's the key question. Um, also, knowledge is a process, not a product. Same, uh, same idea here. And these are very important, very powerful ideas. Now, next is that knowledge has a, has a half-life. So if you knew something in 1952, 1953, it's probably still true. Uh, that's no longer not, that's no longer the case. So of course, if you're building static courses, um, how do you keep that course current? Especially given that with this river of knowledge idea, what really matters is the most current knowledge. You can get the foundational stuff, yes, um, to, to to sort of caricature through Google. <laughs> yes, uh, but what you really need is to find the curated sort of high quality current knowledge that's going to make the difference. Now. This, this going back to the state of our learning education and training in our organizations, if we're not currently, we're not, you know, we're not able to sort of keep up with these changes in the nature of knowledge, if we're still doing things the old-fashioned way in training like it's 1899, it's not because we're not doing our job, it's simply because we're talking about the skills and processes of tomorrow, so we shouldn't be surprised that they're not embedded in our existing educational structures. Last but not uh, least here is um, another piece of information that has to do with teamwork and leadership. And in 1986, Robert Kelly at Carnegie Mellon did this uh, study, started this study about how much, when you do your job, uh, how much of the knowledge you're using is knowledge that's right there in your brain, um, and how much you need to sort of get from other places, from, from outside yourself. So in 1986, 75% of what you needed to know in most jobs was right there. In 2006, that's down to 10%. So the, the necessity of connecting with others, and obviously connections are going to happen through technology, are going to be mediated by technology. That's one of the key pieces that we need to look at um, when thinking about designing learning for this, uh, for this century. And really, your know, so, sort of takeaway is that we need to do new things in new ways. We, we you know, so, uh, it's not just the know what; it's not even the know how that we're so good at. It's also sort of building the pipes between these things and making sure that the the, the connections are strong enough to to take us where we need to go to be able to extract and dip into that river of knowledge and get what we need to. Uh, uh, to be able then to uh, perform effectively. And this is a key shift, I believe, in the 20th century, communication mass media was, was really very, very, was central to, uh, to our society. So um, if, um, you know, uh, and we counted eyeballs, and then later into the 1990s, started counting di downloads, and, and into the uh, early 2000s, uh, followers, uh, friends, <laughs> and so on associated with social media. But um, what's interesting about educational approaches in this century is that uh, you, it gives you, they give you the tools to look at what's happening behind the eyeballs, what people are doing with the downloads, and how they're behaving, um, you know, through uh, through social media. So I really believe that this is a key shift from one century to another. Obviously, it's not, you know, it didn't sort of roll over in 2000, but I think it's something that's ongoing, where you've got these sort of two eras: the era of communication. Um, as sort of one tectonic plate clashing with the era of education, which uh, which I believe we are in today, and, and which is a key to insight to um, to thinking about learning strategically within our organizations.
Now come MOOCs. So what about these massive open online courses? And I've tried to sort of uh, describe uh, a simple model that looks at five things. So as your organization sort of hears, discovers these massive open online courses, discovers that there are sort of MOOC providers like Coursera and edX, and some of them are aggressively sort of marketing their services and, and, and their uh, you know, two international um, uh, organizations. Um, these are five things that you need to look at. So alignment to your strategy, content model, production, marketing, and partnership. Now, uh, before going into MOOCs, we have to recognize that there's a huge sort of body of established experience. Um, there are people with very high level expertise in distance learning who've done amazing things with Moodle, who've done amazing things with uh, various learning management systems. And of course, there are a couple of uh, pioneer organizations that have already rolled out or are in the process of rolling out their own MOOCs. Now, what do we want to look at? We want to look at the content. So MOOCs can be used in three ways. One is to fast track to the most current knowledge. And that goes back to that river of knowledge idea. And this is really speaking to your expert audiences. Second is the foundational knowledge. So here you're talking to your, uh, to your students. You know, this is basically if you're if you're uh, OECD, this is a sort of OECD statistics 101. If you're WHO's malaria program, this is WHO, you know, this is sort of malaria 101. Um, and then you have this sort of public policy debate with the general public, and and this this is an interesting one that I don't think has been fully explored by our organizations. I would say that it's one of the aims of the uh, climate change MOOC uh, by from the World Bank. So if you look at the existing projects here, you have um, the World Economic Forum's uh, announcement of its Forum Academy, with a first uh, course on global technology leadership. And it's, uh, you'll see that MOOC, the word, is mentioned nowhere, but it is in partnership with uh, edX. And it's positioned as a professional leadership improvement sort of tool or, you know, uh, or uh, uh, site. Um, so here you have access to the most current knowledge, and this is clearly articulated in the Forum Academy's uh, project, is, is really to provide experts with sort of rapid access to the latest stuff that matters in specific area of work. Uh, this is the uh, World Bank, uh, World Bank's first MOOC about climate change, uh, published through Coursera. And uh, here you have the sort of, it's a combination of foundational knowledge and probably some sort of debate with the general public. Of course, the course, uh, these courses are open to everyone. Now, I said there are five things to consider, so let's look at strategy and alignment. First, we want to see, first uh, sort of get gain perspective of seeing within an organization what is the perception of, of MOOCs, what is the perception, how is le the learning function organized, and how is it evolving and changing, what problems could MOOCs solve for the organization, of, and of course the sort of risk assessment. This, these are some of the key questions to look at feasibility. Um, now, the second thing that comes up is, is this issue of legitimacy. Can your organization be an education provider? And what is its relationship to traditional learning institutions? And this is one of the, this gets really at some the cultural dimension and the identity of your organization. This can be quite a big shift. Even if you're already doing lots of training internally, the idea of sort of having an online presence where you position yourself as an education provider or you supply sort of courses to a MOOC provider, there's still a lot of questions to consider here. Now, uh, w looking at the business model, so currently MOOCs, uh, what looks like the most viable business model is uh, the sale of certificates. So the, the courses are open to everyone, they're free, but if you want the certificate of completion that says from the organization or from a partner or academic institution that says you've, you've done all the coursework and that's been verified, then that's something worth paying for it. Turns out Yes, uh, basically we're looking at 5% completion rates, or let's assume, let's be generous and assume 10% completion rate, and then um, of those, 10% are going to be willing to pay for a certificate. So currently, it's actually very difficult to find an international organization that has an audience that's already there, where using that math, that simple math, you could actually pay for uh, or recover costs for the production of a course that costs, say, 100,000 euros. Now, MOOCs can be produced for, for cheap, cheaper than that, and there are lots of people working on sort of affordability of production costs, but there's no way of getting around that the fact that producing high-quality content is a time-consuming, expensive endeavor. 
Now, insourcing versus outsourcing. Now, there is there are some open source solutions, and specifically the Open edX and Google Course Builder installations that are available. So you can sort of, as an organization, you can set up and run your own MOOC platform. So that's one of the key questions, and it's really an insourcing versus outsourcing dilemma. Should you do this, and if so, how? Um, and this leads to looking at the value proposition of MOOC providers. So basically many of them, and in fact many of their sort of contractual agreements are written as if they were simply content hosts. But obviously they're in a position to provide other things like instructional design expertise to actually produce the, 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 the MOOCs, um, the, the learning design. So how you're actually going to design the activities that are going to get learners from point A to point B where they come out with sort of new skills, knowledge, and competencies. The second thing is content. The third thing, sorry, is, is content production capacity. So that's the ability specifically to produce the videos. Right now, most MOOCs are b b based on sort of short, a series of short videos. That's the sort of main meat. That's the meat of the uh, of the content. Producing high quality, high you know, professional videos is is expensive. Uh, so this is one of the things to um, to consider. Now, marketing reach and audience. The idea is that you know Coursera with six million people on the platform. By uh, partnering with them, you can um, you can reach uh, potentially reach that audience in addition to your own audiences. I think I believe Coursera is closer to three million, six million is the total aggregate of all the, these MOOC platforms. Sorry. Now, brand association is another one. So if you're with Coursera, you're with the most prestigious, uh, some of the most prestigious universities on the planet. Uh, edX, you're with Harvard and MIT, and so on. FutureLearn, you're with the UK's sort of best and brightest universities, minus a few that specifically have not associated themselves with that project. Um, so brand association might be of value to your organization, especially with respect to that question of legitimacy uh, you know, uh, to, to sort of enter the education space. Now, one of the questions that's specific to IGOs is um, with respect to open educational resources or OER is that the MOOC platforms are currently closed so they they use proprietary formats they're not interoperable and uh, some of the uh, MOOC uh, providers see their feature set as a competitive advantage which means they're not going to share or open up or open source those features so if you do a MOOC for one provider say FutureLearn you cannot take that course and put it on edX you know it's a much more complicated and therefore time consuming and costly process and there's no way also for a learner to to sort of pull out content from a from a from a, from a MOOC to download it and then remix and reuse it and republish it uh, you know, by other means or in other contexts. So as long as these problems uh, you know these the, the, now with IGOs having adopted or a number of IGOs having adopted a Creative Commons license specific to the to the IGO context, I think this is a really important issue to push with a MOOC provider so that they change and adapt. Now these are some of the other. Um, criteria to look at with the uh, MOOC provider. So we're looking at the contractual relationship. A lot of it falls under that, making sure that in the partnership agreement, in the memorandum of understanding and whatever, you know, if you go the outsource, if you outsource some of these, some of the functions of, of, uh, of MOOCs uh, to a MOOC provider, you want to look at their prior experience in working with non-university partners. Um, yes, uh, because as because IGOs and NGOs are not universities, they're going to have specific needs, and these needs, uh, these gaps may you know may need to be addressed by the MOOC provider. So make sure they they, they, they can actually they're actually in a position to do that. We want to look at the roles and responsibilities. Um, we want to look at governance as well. You know, if you if you sign with Coursera, for example, what do you have any say as an organization? organization what Coursera does or how it does it. Uh, we want to look at the openness, the size of the development team, and the responsiveness of course on their feature needs. So if you need a feature specific, if for a learning activity you want to do things a certain way, does the platform have that flexibility? Um, you want to look obviously at the size of and what access as an organization or partner you'll have to the registered user base, what what the uh, MOOC platform provider uh, is going to do to help you uh, find that target audience or to find new audiences specifically. Um, the access to and use of learner analytics, uh, that's one of the key issues. Who owns it? Who owns that data? How, what access do you have to it? To it? What access does the MOOC provider have to it? 
Uh, research is a key issue because right now MOOCs are very new. So research is indispensable. It's not just a nice to have. You need to be sort of researching what's coming out of the of the uh, first MOOCs or the, the the pilots you're doing to learn from that to be able to improve um, the uh, the quality of the of the course content and its delivery. Need to look at what the MOOC provider for uh, offers in terms of credentialing and certification. Does it have you know the features so that for people to pay for certificates? And basically, what are the revenue sharing models for this? So, um, last, uh, this will be my last point is really about you know thinking um, how to position MOOCs, especially if your organization has prior experience with e-learning. Where does it fit in? So, need to think about a learning system approach. So, this is from a disaster management context. So, here you have sort of preparation, standby, deployment, post-deployment assessment, and competencies. And you want to look at these branches to distinguish between formal and informal sort of learning. Uh, distinguish between learning that you do on your own self and uh, learning that you do in the network, and then synchronous and asynchronous, self-based and self-organized. So you end up with eight branches, and you want to figure out where MOOCs fit into you know, so those eight branches and how, and you want to make sure that you've got all the branches covered. So um, in developing a sort of learning strategy, MOOCs may be a part of what you need, maybe one component, but they're not going to cover all the branches. So it's definitely wor worth, you know, so, so sort of considering that perspective, that matrix organization of network self-synchronous, asynchronous, self-based, self-organized, and the key distinction between formal and informal learning to actually be able to meet the needs of, of your learners, whether they're internal or external audiences. So that's it. Thank you for uh, listening to this uh, presentation from Learning Strategies International. This is lsi.io. And, um, and please do follow us on the uh, lsi.io uh, website on Twitter. Learning SI is the Twitter handle and uh, subscribe to these newsletter to be sure that you receive the uh, most um, most up-to-date information from LSI.